Welcome to My Life Chassidus Applied, episode 404. This is a special pre edition, being that next Shabbos, Pasha Midbar, will be Erev Shavuos, going straight into Shavuos Sunday, Saturday night, Matzai Shabbos, into Sunday and Monday, outside of Israel. And that's Israel. In Israel, it's a one-day holiday, Sunday. This program is dedicated in merit of Baruch bin Yamin ben Menuch Elena and Miriam bas Chai Sara Altes, Yukasil ben Leir Rochel and Rochel bas Liba Farkash, and is dedicated by Pinchas Tadras ben Miriam and Sara bas Rochel Altes. But before we begin about Shavuos, sadly, I want to address the horrific shooting in Texas this past week, the killing of 19 innocent children. And, uh, and some adults. Firstly, many questions came in about it. Secondly, something that we can't ignore. As the Rambam says, and this is true universally, when there's a catastrophe, it's never an accident. There's always something we have to look at within ourselves, be introspective. He says it's actually cruel to see it as mikra nikra, just some type of random accident. And we need to do some soul searching. Now, you could say the Rambam is talking particularly about the fasting, the Jewish holidays, the Jewish fast days, I should say. But the, the, the concept, the theme, the reason for it is applicable to any tragedy and any catastrophe. So let me read a few of the questions. I'm not going to read them all because there were just too many to read, but a good selection, too, that really captured the, the spirit of what all of us are feeling. Another week another few mass shooting massacres in supermarkets and schools. Hashem help us. Has the Rebbe ever made any comments about these random acts of violence and murder? And what causes someone to be so angry at the world to do such a terrible crime to innocent people? And what we can do to recognize a person in danger of acting out and be able to prevent these horrible shootings? Another person writes, Hi, Rabbi Jacobson. What are we able to do as, res- as a response to the horrific events which occurred? Everyone around me is talking about how terrible it is, but most people are only suggesting security improvements in schools. Also, although this could possibly cure a symptom, it would still fail to heal the root of, such, of a much larger problem. There must be a new initiative instilled into the education systems which imbues children, children with an understanding and sense of a higher purpose. How many mass shootings and lives will it take for the world to wake up and realize that there must be a change in the way the youth are educated? World leaders must open their eyes and see that these chaotic events are a clear result of a lack of values instilled in the education systems. People from all walks of life should be demanding from education systems a change in the methodology of how our children are being taught. The tragic loss of so many precious innocent lives will be in vain if the world does not take to heart these events and take some sort of action. Nothing would be sadder sadder than for another month to pass and this event to blow in the wind and everyone move on with their monotonous lives until another wake-up call like this occurs again. Can you please recommend some practical actions that can be taken to use this experience as a catalyst for true change? How do we stop this trend of disasters occurring failing to respond appropriately, and simply moving on with our lives until another devastating event occurs. How do we do, how do we go about revolutionizing the education systems in the world? Thank you for everything you do. Okay, well, as you see, these are sentiments that reflect the feelings that any decent person has when you hear about these type of tragic events. And especially when you hear about the response, or lack of response, I should say, taking over an hour to actually storm the, where the shooter was barricaded with the children. I mean, it's horrific as any way you look at it. So there's no question that there are short-term solutions that, that must be employed, and that may be additional security. Gun control needs to be looked at. I'm not going to say it's one thing or another. It's a combination. It's like anything. If, God forbid, somebody breaks into someone's house, what you do is also you take all security measures, better burglar alarms, better locks, better doors. You do whatever it takes. Unfortunately, everything becomes politicized. As soon as you say guns, 
So then there's the gun, the gun lobby, the anti-gun lobby, and, the, and then everyone's trying to take advantage and use it, especially in this media age, which just makes it even more obscene because instead of c coming together and just thinking about the children and thinking about innocent lives, and that's all that matters, it becomes a political battle and a political game. So what to do about politics, I am beyond me. I just can say that we have, a, we, meaning we, the grassroots, us people, we the people can do much. So firstly, absolutely every short-term possible thing you can do, whether it's a security, whether it's better police training, I mean, or police that have the courage to know what to do, better leadership. And yes, how should an 18-year-old on their birthday be able to go get such guns? So fine, I'm not going to get into the details of how to work it out, but all that has to be looked at. Just like a burglar alarm does not guarantee that someone, a burglar is not going to break into a home or a light shining in the street at night is going to prevent a mugging, but like a helmet. It's another preventive measure, measure another deterrent. Then there's the long term that especially the second writer writes about. And there's no doubt that it's about education ultimately. Both how parents are educating children and both how our schools are educating children. Now I should add, the most important thing of all, and perhaps Hashgach HaPrat is going into Shavuos, as I said, this is a special Shavuos edition, if Matan Torah, of all its teachings, and their revolutionary teachings, one of the key things is that Loisirtzach, do not murder, is one of the Ten Commandments that were set on by Matan Torah on Shavuos, 3,334 years ago, but it follows Anoichi Hashem Alekecha. As the Rebbe makes the point, seemingly Loisirtzach, not to murder, not to steal, or the other rational commandments and mitzvahs, why, do you, why, why are they dependent on Anoichi Hashem Alekecha? Why do they have to begin, I am your God? Because without ultimately a God, without an accountability to an eye that sees and an ear that hears, in the words of the Mishnah that the Rebbe would cite so often, Ayin Reyev Eizen Shamas, then all these laws become arbitrary. Because you could always make exceptions. The Nazis found all kinds of rationale that they're playing God. And in certain instances where murder is allowed, but it's not murder, it's self-defense. Or you decide that certain parts of the human race are not worth living. You can come up with any crazy and obscene and, and disgusting uh, theory. I am your God is similar to what the, just to use a secular example, what the Declaration of Independence says. All men are created equal. And their creator gives them inalienable rights. Once it's coming up from creator, then none of us are more equal than others. And the same thing here. The creator of life told us what are the rules and says, do not murder. When you take out God from the picture, and again, the point here is not religious God. We respect separation of church and state, but when we take idea of accountability, which is what has happened in the last few hundred years, especially where science has replaced God, the enlightenment went out of all out effort. And maybe they had certain reasons for it because the God that was presented to them by their authorities was a corrupt God or was also abused and used for power and, and, and control. Fine. But the concept is that we need to have an accountability to something higher. Is that a guarantee that people will not murder? Look, there are people that believe in God and truly sincerely, and they've done many crimes. But it's the beginning of a foundation of an attitude. In addition to that, to go a step further, it also teaches us that life is sacred. I would submit that most people don't think life is sacred. Life is an accident, a biological quirk. Of course, everybody likes their own life, but the sanctity of life, that it's not yours, you don't own your own life, and you don't own the life of others. You don't even own the life of your children. Is also, it's a godly thing, it's a divine gift. This is not taught in our schools and not in our homes. I can't say not at all, obviously, but not enough. And in many ways, it's actually been cut out. And sadly and tragically, our comforts and our prosperity has actually contributed to becoming much more lackadaisical much more apathetic to these type of values because it does come down to that. Now, of course, there are people that are troubled and have suffered from mental illness and other emotional problems and they can go on a rampage. 
So that too needs to be addressed, but nipped in the bud. Usually such people, their parents, educators, somebody should be aware of them. But there's become a certain, I don't know the right word for it, it just, you just feel that when it comes to these fundamental things, the, what matters more is whether the stock market is going up or down and whether we get the, the latest gadget, technology, or what is the latest film that came out, what's happening at the Academy Awards or in sports, then a focus on these critical issues of the very soul of our children and our youth and our adults. The first and foremost thing is in life is to take care of our souls and to take care of the souls of those that came under our care and guidance. Like a gardener, every child is a flower, but a flower has to be taken care of. You have to nourish it, you have to nurture it, you have to water it, and you have to weed the garden to eliminate toxic influences, pollutants, and other things that can contaminate a soul. So the revolution that's needed is soulful education, an education that teaches children the importance of their lives, the importance of other people's lives. These are divine souls, divine lives that were sent here for a reason. There's no question if that was inculcated, instilled, imbued in every child from the youngest age, we would firstly ourselves value ourselves more and value others more and also discover that we complement each other. Again, is this a magic pill? But this is the Matan Torah message. If you want a universal message, yes, that God came on Sinai and told us, I gave you life and now I'm giving you my mandate. And my mandate is based on the sanctity, the dignity of the soul. And all the laws are based on that foundation. But if you think of it that way, it's not just a matter, it's not a religious issue that so many people like to dismiss or say, okay, it's for religious people, but it's not for the public forum. The, the, the founding fathers were not pushing religion. They understood that this foundation is necessary. It actually undermined even their own interests. Many of them were slave owners, if not all of them. And it was due to the fact that they wrote, all men are created equal. At that point, they didn't consider everybody men. But ended the being that all people are created equal so that means that there's the concept of slavery, that some people are less equal than others. They themselves undermine their own interests, which is another comment that many people have pointed out. Whether it was a divine wisdom that went through them and ultimately prevailed, however you explain it. The point is, and I'm specifically using, even though this is chassidus applied, and I can use Torah sources, and I am using them, Matan Torah, Sinai, but I'm specifically speaking in a language that everybody can relate to, because we have to be able to communicate this to everyone, and we don't want to get into a, a debate now about religion. This is not about religious people trying to make other people religious. This is about the foundation of what life is all about. And even those that claim that they're not believers, they may not use the word sanctity because it sounds too, uh, too spiritual or too religious for them. But there's, there's, it's the foundation of everything. If you don't have that, then everything becomes arbitrary. Then it becomes negligible. You know what? They say when you wake up in the morning and get out of bed, you kill thousands, if not millions, of bacteria. If we're just evolved bacteria, and yes, bacteria are more invisible, you don't see it, and they don't cry out, and there's no blood. But if we're evolved bacteria, let's be honest, why is killing a human being so, so much more terrible? And still people will see that there's a distinction. But you see, the Nazis is just an extreme example of how far it can go. I remember the shooting in Columbine. And it was perfectly, they said, normal children, students, that came in and shot their own, their own friends, their own classmates. And they had no mental illness, and they were not disturbed. And then they killed themselves. So I remember I was speaking then at a school in Australia. Without going to a long story, but briefly, we had a big session, and it was a voluntary session, meant boys and girls ages 14 to 17. And I asked them, could such a thing happen here in Sydney? Mariah, there's a school called Mariah there. And 
to my surprise, I thought they would say, it's an American violence, it's American kids, not here. They said, absolutely. And I went around the gym. It was a big gym where they all were sitting when I was speaking. And I asked people to give the reasons why. So there were all kinds of thoughts. Some were more mature, a little less mature. Children, teenagers. But a few said things that were extremely insightful. Which was, what's the value of life? That doesn't mean just because people don't have the value of life, they're going out to shoot. But when you're playing with violent video games, and you see it on television and film, at a point it desensitizes you to life and the sanctity of life. And then you just have to add a few more ingredients, a little boredom, adventure, experimentation, maybe bad influences, maybe a bad day. Again, this does not mean it will happen, but you'll have the ingredients here. And in order to prevent and preempt, as I discussed with them, is to teach people you matter. Your life matters. So I submitted that these kids, it wasn't that they thought that they mattered more than them. They killed themselves too. Life was not so significant. So, of course, nobody wants to kill and nobody wants to be killed. That's the natural way we protect ourselves. But put the other things together, anything could happen. And thank God it doesn't happen every day, God forbid. This has to be a revolution in the schools, in our homes, in every possible way. And it's the essential message of Matan Torah, of Shavuos, among many others. But if you think about it, it's about that, that there is a higher authority. And he told us these are the rules. And he told us life is sacred. Property is sacred. Talk about the other commandments, but we're focusing on this one here. I don't know what it will take. It will take. The politicization of it, the politicization of it, the, the, sense, the, the media, the, it creates so many distortions that it becomes, it, it, does, it doesn't seem to add to the solution, it seems like part of the problem. So it has to come from us. And maybe that's exactly why we're here, to be a light onto nations, another message of Matan Torah, of Shavuos, and to teach these principles, and thank God, the world has become a less violent world less wars, as has been pointed out by many scholars and statisticians. And it really comes down to the principles that Avram Avinu, Abraham, promoted, and then ultimately were consummated and formalized in the mandate called the Torah, Shavuos, 3,334 years ago, and ultimately has become the standard for the world. Most countries today not just the United States, so many other countries have embraced these principles. So it's a far better than it was in the past. But we have new issues. It's not solved because today sometimes the, actually the comforts and our freedoms can go the other direction. Create the apathy that I was talking about. So I can go on, we can have a whole program just on this. I don't want to focus just on this, even though I don't want to call it a just. It's not a just, it's, it's worthy to, worth talking about. But it's something we all can teach, learn from, and teach our children and ourselves. Now, I know some may say, this is not happening here in my home. I have a from Jewish home, a Hasidic home, or whatever it may be. Everybody can be taught more and more about the sanctity of life. Because even though, yes, there are certain communities, it's hard to imagine anyone's going to do anything like that. But there's other ways of hurting others. We could bully people. We could emotionally abuse and hurt people. Judgmentalism, divisiveness, anger, hatred. There are many ways that the Torah equates with murder. I'm not going to, I'm not going to equate the two, obviously. But it says even when you, when you insult someone, you speak Lush and Hari, you insult them and, and you embarrass them, and you cause their face to become pale. It says, it's like the Gemara says, that the blood rushes out and you become white, the blood of the face gets flushed. That's a form of death. It's like pulling the blood out of somebody. So subtly we all can use lessons again and again about the sanctity of our lives and other people's lives. And the sanctity of your mission in this world. Critical to add that you're here for a purpose. Did this gunman know that he was here for a purpose? Was he ever told? But not just told. 
that it was in a passionate way, understand that you have a role to play in your life. How many people are wandering around? They have no idea why they're here. Which is just an extension of that. Not just I'm your God and told you don't kill and life is uh, sacred. But your life has purpose and meaning. That's what Matan Torah teaches us. It has meaning, purpose, and do something about it. Live up to it. There's no question in my mind that if this was taught to our children from the youngest age, and then, of course, children become adults, if it was taught to us from the youngest age, and in a sincere way, in a heartfelt way, words from the heart enter the heart, it would preempt and prevent so many of the ailments that we face. On the extreme level, we're talking about what happened here. But on subtle levels, how much aimlessness, how much boredom, how much addiction, How much does the, the, the lack of proper attachment to the people you're supposed to love and to your very purpose of life and to the God that put you here is causing us to get attached to other things that are not healthy? The list goes on. And this is the longer term. Because you can't do this overnight. This means a steady, persistent process from the youngest of age what we inculcate, what we teach our children. And it couldn't be more fitting to the time that we are as we prepare last week before we honor and celebrate and revisit the events that happen at Matan Torah and they're recreated every year at this time of the year. It's not just remembering something that happened over three millennia ago. It's happening now. Every day. Every day it's like a new thing. Just as there we stood with awe and reverence and the other expressions used, so too today we should stand that way. And when we go to the synagogue and hear the Ten Commandments, and as the Rebbe encouraged and instituted in 1980, that everyone should go, men, women, and children, and even young newborns, for this reason, to hear, as they heard then, the voice of God, of what is our mandate, what is our mission in life, the sanctity of life, the sanctity of fulfilling your calling for which you were created. So the lesson is very, very clear in that sense, which leads us to some other topics that are connected to Shavuos. So let me take it from there. And this being a segue. So we always read Parsha Bamidba before Shavuos. The simple reason is it says Bamidba Sinai. It's the beginning of the fourth book of number, the book of numbers. Bamidba Sinai. As it was in Bamidba Sinai, that's where there was Bahar Sinai, Mount Sinai, was in the Sinai desert and wilderness where the Torah was given. But that's just a technical, that's a geographical explanation. There's something deeper here. Bamidbar Sinai, the Bamidbar. As a matter of fact, the Sefer, the book is called Bamidbar, you don't even say Sinai. The wilderness, which seems like the, the, missing the main point. Why would we focus on the wilderness, which sounds like a negative thing? So the question is asked, why was the Torah given in a wilderness? The Jews, God could have taken them. He's giving them his most precious gift, Chem de Gnuza the hidden treasure of his. After 26 generations from the beginning of time, beginning of creation, God is finally giving them this Torah. So you'd think, you give someone such a special gift, you'd bring them to Jerusalem. Could have found maybe a beautiful place in Egypt or other places in the world. No, it was intentionally done in the wilderness, in a hot, a hot wilderness. No one knows what the temperature was that morning, but it was definitely hot in that region, especially that time of year, a desert. And a desert of Nochus Sarav Akrav, a dangerous place, not a place of, not a habitat, not conducive to human, to human civilization. Why would you give the Torah such a special thing? I mean, and a, and a simple example, you take someone you love to a restaurant, to a beautiful venue, and you give them the gift. So there are different answers given for it. Two answers that I'll share, which are relevant to our discussion and relevant as well to the lesson I shared so far. 
Number one is, a midbar is called a mokam hefker. It's no man's land. Legally, if somebody loses, let's say, a wallet or an object, so if it's near a home or, or in a private uh, area, a uh, rishus ayachid, so you have to assume that it belongs to the person who lives there. If it's a rishus arabin in a public area, but a place where people live and, 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 and do business and walk and, and move about, there are also rules. Gemara and Bob Mitzia talks about it at length. What happens if you lose something in the wilderness? Nobody lives there. It's called Hefka, Mokim Hefka. So it says there, it's considered, it doesn't belong to anybody. Because the area, no, but doesn't belong to anybody. It's not a Rosh Hashanah, not a Rosh Hashanah, not a private not property, and not a public property. Humans don't live there. So Hashem, God was teaching, the Torah doesn't belong to anyone. I'm giving it specifically in a place that nobody can claim ownership over it, and therefore claim royalties. You give it in any city, the city would come and say, every time you want to learn Torah, send us a check for royalties. The Torah is Torah Semis, is God's gift given to us for free to Moses, through Moses, because it's the truth, it's the blueprint for life. The greatest gift, completely for free. There's no book on earth that you can get for free. The best book on earth is free. But it's not just free financially, it means it's accessible to you. You know, they tell the joke about, it's a sad joke, but it, it, it's very apropos. It's a joke they talk about a, a very corrupt rabbi. And someone came to him and said, can you teach me the Torah? I hear it has the answers to all the secrets of life. Of course. How much will it cost me? I can't charge you. God didn't charge us. So he was very impressed. He's going to get the secrets of life for free. They sit down. Of course, the Torah is in Hebrew, the original. And the rabbi, this rabbi, the charlatan, says to him, well, Hebrew lessons will be $20,000. This is exactly why Matan Torah was given in, in Hamidbah. This joke is a, a very, is, is a joke. But sometimes you could feel that the, the truth of Torah doesn't belong to anybody. It doesn't belong to rabbis. It doesn't belong to Moshe Rabbein. That's why it was given in Hamidbah. A second reason is that we have to be, which is connected to the first one, if you think about it, is because we have to be like a midbar. We have to empty ourselves. You know, a person who's civilized, it's a beautiful thing, but they're shaped by their civilization and culture. The midbar is saying, you have to have a clean slate. You have to empty everything. Be objective. Be open-minded. Be receptive to absorb higher truths. If you bring in your prejudices, your biases, your preconceived notions, it will somewhat color and, and even distort, dilute and distort what the Torah has to say. So be like a midbar. Which answers another question someone asked. Why was the Torah given? Let me just find that question. What is the significance of the Torah being given on Har Sinai? As, if, as we, if as we are taught, it might be because Sinai was the smallest of the mountains and it's to teach us a lesson in humility, then wouldn't it, have made more, wouldn't it have made more sense not to give the Torah on any mountain at all, and instead give it in a valley or in a giant pit? And that's true. Mochich mokol it says. That Sinai was the smallest of all mountains, but it was a mountain. We'll get to the mountain part. But why the smallest? Because to teach us humility. That's why it says, Moshe kibbal Torah me Sinai. Moshe received the Torah from Sinai. It should have said, Moshe kibbal Torah me Hashem. God received the Torah from God. I'm, we should have received the Torah from God. Why does he talk about Sinai? Sinai was just the location. Because he received the Torah from Sinai. He received a lesson from Sinai. And he was able to receive Kibble because he was like Sinai. He learned the lesson from Sinai to be a mountain, but the smallest mountain, meaning the humility, to be receptive, to absorb, to listen. And not the process. A Talmud Chacham is the greatest compliment you can give someone. A student of Chacham. You're always a student. The Talmud begins on page two always. Dav Beis. What about page one? Page one is blank. Reish is Chacham, Yiras Hashem. The beginning of all wisdom is reverence for something greater than you are, like we spoke earlier. 
reverence of an authority, accountability to something greater than you are because our subjectivity will somewhat slant or prejudice or color our attitudes. So you need to be like a midbar, empty. You need to empty yourself. You need to be like the smallest of mountains. So why mountain? Why not a valley or a pit? Because on the other end, it's not meant for us to be an askupa nedresis, a doormat. This is not about destroying our self-esteem and breaking our, uh, demoralizing and breaking our spirit. You need to be mountain because you need to have that self-confidence. You need to feel secure. You need to feel. But that security and confidence is not because your ego is big. It's because, precisely because you're receiving something greater than you are. That makes you greater. So you need to be a mountain. You need to be proud. Not lowly. Not low self-esteem. Humble. But not low, not, but not low self-esteem. Oh no, but not shuffle. So it's a mountain, but it's the lowest of mountains. So that's the second lesson by Midbar and Sinai. Receiving the humility, the emptiness to be able to listen, to hear. Nasa v'nishma. See, even the nishma, which comes after the nasa, is also to hear. To hear and understand. So these are some of the lessons we learn. And why we read Bamidbar before Shavuos. Because it prepares us to enter into that type of zone. And the lessons are very clear in life, in marriage, in relationships, with, with your spouse, with children, with friends. Having that type of receptivity, be like a midbar, empty yourself. That doesn't mean eliminate what you know. It just be ready to be recept- receptive. Be able to listen to another opinion. It's not all about you. All this is part of being able to receive the Torah. My spirit, like we say at the end of Shemin Esrei every day, my spirit is It's like dust to all. And then psachli bi sacha. Open my heart to Torah. Exactly the same idea. You you become receptive. A full cup can be filled. An empty cup can be filled. In this parsha, we also read by mid by the census. So the question is asked, what counting? Right in the beginning of the chapter is counting the Jews, as Rashi says, When you love somebody, due to their preciousness, you count them all the time. Like you see a mother counting her children, making sure they're all there. But it's not just making sure they're there; it's also out of love. Out of love, you want to, as the Ramban explains, because when you count, you have to look at the children. You have to look at the people you love. But then comes the question, how do we recon- reconcile the senses of the Jewish people with the teaching that we're not supposed to count people? In Parsha Bamidu, the prince of each tribe is commanded to take a census. How do we reconcile this with the, yes, that we're not supposed to count groups because it can invite an eye in horror. So first let's establish where does it say that. So the Gemara in Yuma, 22b, and the Rambam and Mishnah Teir in the laws of... Um, he cites it. That also tells us that a blessing is not found in something that has been weighed nor in something that has been measured. And that's why we don't count. Nor in something that has been counted. But only something that has been hidden. Hidden from the eyes. So how do you explain it? So, the, so there's several explanations given. When the Ebershter first told the first counting by Machsa Sashekli, he didn't say count the people. He said, let them give a half a coin, a half a shekel, and you count through that. So in other words, you're not counting the people, you're counting something that represents them. As such, that's the way the counting happened. So that's one way to reconcile it. Rabbeinu Bechai in uh, Shemois says, you don't count single individuals, but when you count a community, so the good deeds of the community counters any type of negative thing that may happen. This is in Shemois, Lamed uh, Yud Aleph.
Panim Yofis talks about it as well. Also, overall, another point has to be made that this is the Ebeshter doing the counting, which is very different than when humans are counting, even though he's telling them to count, but it's with a, it's a divine mandate here, a divine command. So that, probably can, that can also explain why that gives an additional strength. Because, because the point here is not the counting which creates a nine hurdle like you're counting and, and being proud. Like the Rebbe once told a grandfather, he said, we don't count grandchildren. We don't count these blessings. We don't want to add anything. But when God does it, he's doing it out of his love, it's a difference. So when you add, add all these answers, that's the response. But the bottom line is that the counting also seems to be a preparation to Matan Torah because by Matan Torah you have to have all the Jews have to be there. If one was missing, he couldn't give the Torah. One. There were 600,000 between 20 and 60 years old men. That's the number for those that were able to go to battle. But there were women and children and people younger than 20 and over 60 men. So it was millions. Everyone had to be there. And we're also told every soul through all the generations was there as well. So you see the significance of every individual. That's the main focus here. But how to count, that has to be done the right way, as we discussed. Next question about Shavuos. What exact parts of the Torah were given at Sinai? The Torah was given at Shavuos. How do we understand it? Was it only the Aserah Sadibras, the Ten Commandments? It's interesting, we call it Ten Commandments, but the truth is, Dibras means statements or words. Ten phrases, ten utterances. But for some reason it's been translated Ten Commandments even in books and uh, articles that the Rebbe himself edited. Just pointing that out. So what was it? Was it only the Ten Commandments that were given? Was it the Chumash with events that hadn't occurred yet? Was it the Mishnah and Gemara with discussions by Rabbeim that hadn't yet been born and disputes not yet resolved? Was it post-Talmudic Torah decisions? Was it Chassidus including the Zoya, Tanya, etc.? Well, it's a good question. The Gemara talks about whether the Torah was given chesuma, nitna, or was given parsha by parsha. So here's the, 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 here's the, the general picture. The Ten Commandments were first definitely stated, states clearly in the Chumash, were, were said. There's a question whether the Jews heard all the ten or they only heard the first one and two. And the rest they heard through Moshe. But on the other hand, it says, I'll call Dibra Dibra Parchanish Mosan. So they clearly experienced the Ten Commandments, one way or the other. We're also told the Ten Commandments include in them the whole Torah. So essentially, they're hearing the whole Torah. They didn't, they're not broken down. But like we say, Anything that a good student will be machadish, will innovate through the generations, through history, was given at Moshe at Sinai. What does that mean? At Sinai. So you could say that Moshe Rabbeinu, besides the mountain Torah itself, remember he was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. So he learned much more than just Chumash. So we know Torah B'Pirushanit. Now he was also taught the Torah Shabal Peh. So you could say, but Sinai means from everything that, was that he learned. But he also didn't learn everything that would go for generations to come. The Gemara says clearly that he was once hearing Rabbi Akiva teaching. In heaven, he heard Rabbi Akiva teaching. And he was so taken by what he's teaching. And he says, why was the Torah not given through him? He looked at his teaching things I don't even know. And then one of the students asked Rabbi Akiva, and it says, it says like, Chol Shadaita. He felt like weakened. He felt like demoralized in a way. Then he heard one of the students ask Rabbi Akiva, where did you take this from? He said, Allah Allah Moshe Messina. I heard it from Moshe. So it says, Nochadaiti. Because it came from Moshe Rabbeinu. So how, we, how do we explain that? Because in a revealed way, what you got with the Klolin, the general principles, like in anything, you can have a general principle that over time is broken down. Like in mathematics, you have theorems, you have postulates, you have corollaries. You have things that break down so at the time, the one who's teaching it may only teach the general principle. And then as different scholars discuss it, even the time of Moshe Rabbeinu, it's broken down further and further, but it's all encompassed and based on the guidelines and methodologies. Like we say in the morning, the Yud Gimel Midrash, the 13 methodologies. 
that are used, how to derive from either a written, the written Torah or in the Talmud and the mission in the Talmud, the different methods of how we derive from an idea and not go of the reservation. It has to be within a misgeras, within a structure, within that method. So that's what we say is how it's all encompassed. Now, as far as I said before, the Gemara, Chsuma Nitna, the second opinion is called Megillis Nitna. Chsuma Nitna means the whole thing was given. So in a way, Hashem was telling Moshe what was going to come. So the Torah included even events that didn't happen yet. Megillus Nitna would mean that it was evolved throughout the Midbar. Moshe kept on writing as things happened and as God told him what to write. Then the question is about the last verses in the Torah, Moshe Rabbein about his own passing. So the Gemara talks about who wrote that. Did Yeshua write it? Did Moshe write it with his tears? But you see from that, that things were written throughout the 40 years in the wilderness. Including, of course, the fact that Moshe wrote Sifre Torah at the end of his lifetime. 13 Sifre Torahs, Torah scrolls. So that also seems to suggest that this was written later. The question is, was there already a document beforehand? So we know for sure the Ten Commandments. Then the question is, how much more detail? We know Moshe learned detail. Then he learned it up in heaven 40 days, 40 nights. Then he taught it. We know Moshe taught. So the people learned it. The Rambam says they would make down, they would write notes on tablets, just notes, because Torah Shabbat Peh was what, would, what they taught, the interpretation was not allowed to be written. Later, many years later, Abenu HaKadosh, Eslas Eslashem, Heferet Eresecha, when they saw it was being forgotten, the sages began to document that, became the Mishnah and the Gemara later, which we call the Talmud, Torah Shabbat Peh. But before that, it was all Baal Peh. So I hope that clarifies a bit. Did we accidentally oversleep on the day we were supposed to be standing on Mount Sinai, ready to receive the Torah, because we were very tired and exhausted from a three-day period of working and preparing to get ready for the Torah? What exactly were we doing to prepare during those three days? And are we also supposed to do similar preparations each year before Shavuos? Was Hashem upset that we were late? So here goes the question. The Rebbe brings in Lekut Esiches, famous one of the reasons why we're up at night, first night of Shavuos, the, the, the night is because the Jews slept. So the question is, after a momentous event, historical event, they went to sleep? I mean, of all times. So the different explanations is, the spiritual explanation, that they were on an exalted level. Sleep wasn't because they got tired and exhausted. It was the soul preparing in a way, reaching to a higher place. So why are we awake? Because still, consciousness is critical to be, you have to be awake. So though they had a good reason, when we go to sleep, we're not necessarily on that level. So we have to be awake, but we appreciate essentially the superconscious experiences that one has when they're asleep. So it was not seen as something that's something negligent. It wasn't a sin. Now it's true that they did prepare three days before, and we also that's called the Shleish Yisimei Hagbala. The three days before Shavuos, we also prepare. More today, it's not so much in, in practical things that we do, but it's, first of all, it's a personal preparation. And there's also the different dinim that we have to do, as we prepare for Shavuos. Okay. Why is the 50th level of impurity considered a point of no return when we have a concept in Torah that anyone can do tshuva faster than the blink of an eye? Even a man in the Talmud called Rabbi Lezer, Rabbi Lezer ben Derdaya, who was considered such a villain that he was told that he was told his sins are so severe they are, not, they are unforgivable. Even he was able to do tshuva when he had so much remorse, o- remorse over his sins that he died and afterward a baskel went, say, say, went out, a voice from heaven went out saying his tshuva was accepted. So when, he left, when we left Mitzrayim amongst miracles and wonders in order to receive the Torah, what's the difference if we were in the 49th gate of impurity or the 238th gate of impurity? There's always a concept of tshuva. If Rabbi Elizabeth and Dedai could do it, Kalvachemer, for sure, we could have also done it, especially while being, by be, well, while being guided by a tzaddik Moshe Rabbeinu. Well, uh, first of all, even though Rabbi Elizabeth and Dedai did tshuva, and we will have that capacity, but you don't try to prepare for that in the way by saying, 
okay, you know what, I can just go as low down as I can, and I could always do tshuva. It's not an approach. There he did fall, and then he had that awakening, and konay lama b'sha'a He was able to acquire his uh, the world to come in one moment because of this cry was from the depths of his heart. When the Jews were in Egypt, and it says the 49 gates of impurity, that was not something that anyone looks at with pride. That was due to Ervis Aretz, a depraved land that affected them. To the point, yes, to the point that a moment after that, they could have become so toxified they couldn't leave. Of course they could have done tshuva, but it wasn't just tshuva, it wasn't because of their sins, it was due to environment. It's like when you're caught into the abyss in quicksand, and you can't get out of it. Could God have saved them even after the 50th? God can do anything. But you don't wait for such a miracle. So generally speaking, it's like someone who's in a very, very dark place. She'll say, you know what? Don't worry about it, you could be saved. No, you do everything possible to get out even if you're in the 48th gate, or the 47th, or the 1st. The bottom line is they got there already. It was 210 years of a difficult, oppressive gullus. Lesson to us is that even when we're in the darkest place, get out. When you hit rock bottom, don't say, no matter what, I'm going to be saved. No, do something right now. Now, it wasn't the Jews that said, let's get out of Mitzrayim. It was the Abish that said, now's the time. Nigla melch malcham lochem HaKadosh Baruch and he took them out of, which is why we count 49 days of the Omer, one of the reasons to be misakin and repair those tumor, that, the tax, those toxins and pollutants from the 49 gates. And then the 50th day it corresponds to the 49 gates of Bina. These are the holy gates, the pure gates that purify the 49 impure ones. And the 50th gate is Matan Teirah. We don't count that day. We count 49. And the 50th is Matan Teirah. Shad Hanun. Okay. Why is it customary to eat cheesecake and other dairy products on Shavuos? Okay, so a bunch of reasons are given for it. Um, let's just go through them. The Ramah writes, because uh, they, they br- we bring the Shtei Alechem, the two loaves of uh, the carbon on, on Pesach, on, sorry, on Shavuos. Shtei Alechem, Shtei Alechem, the two loaves. Therefore, we eat dairy and we eat meat, representing the two loaves, one reason given. Another is because it was Shabbos. The Jews had converted because they all had to go through a conversion for Mat and Tera. So the kalim that they had before were now no longer kosher. They had to be table them, but it was Shabbos, so they couldn't immerse them. So they ate dairy. And that's why we eat dairy to remind us of that. That's the second reason given. Um, then another reason, just to go through, is Tera is likened to milk, to cholov. And indeed, cholov is gematria 40 which is the 40 days that correspond to the 40 days, hinting to the 40 days of Moshe and Har Sinai. Another example is given is about um, that the Malachim told Moshe Rabbeinu and told Hashem, give us the Torah, the special gift. And he told Moshe to answer. And Moshe said, this Torah is about life on earth, not in heaven. Did you go to Egypt? You weren't in Egypt. Hashem Hashem do you have parents? Did you, were you in Egypt? Do you have parents? Do you have a temptation to steal, to, 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 uh, to kill? God forbid. So it says one of the, so one of the commentaries explains that, um, I think this is the Maram Shif. Yeah. That the Malachim, as holy as they were, at the end of the day, they ate Basar B'chalob. And they were by Avram. They ate meat and milk. The Jews separate between the two. We eat a dairy meal and only afterwards do we eat a meal, a meat meal, but not together. So just to emphasize that. I think the Shalom brings this out as well. Maram Shif. So these are a selection of some of the reasons given for this. The Rebbe has a beautiful sikh on the topic as well, where he discusses this at length, the topic of... Um, of eating dairy on, pace, on uh, Shavuos. Now, on a deeper level, dairy is chesed. Meat is gvura. So, teres eish dos lame, it's a combination of chesed and gvura. Dinim, the halachis is like, dinim is like gvuras, the laws. And the chesed, teres chesed, alashena. Teres is all about kindness and love. 
So Cholov emphasizes the kindness and love of Teda, which is called Teda Kula Le'nitna Lase Shalom Ba'elam. Teda was given to bring peace and love into the world. Okay. Now there are many more topics. Just want to see where we are. Why don't we read from the Torah every day? Is there a special energy on Sunday? To, on Sunday, on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Friday that accomplished what we would that what we would have accomplished if the Torah would have been read that day? Okay, so the Gemara tells us that we're told that we read the Torah every at least once in every three days, because Torah is like Mayim water, ain Mayim el Torah, and Jews can't survive and. Just like you can't survive for three days without water, Jews can't survive without Teda. Famous example that Rabbi Kiva gives with a fox that came to the edge of the water and told the fish, why don't you come out here, change a venue. Obviously, he was looking for a good meal. And the fish said, they say you're such a sly, you're such a wise fox. Pikach, you're wise. Don't you realize this is our sustenance, our water? We come out, we die. So Rabbi Kiva said the same thing. Teda is the sustenance of the Jewish people. They can never leave it. So at least once in three days, we can read the Torah. Shabbos, of course, the whole Pasha, Monday and Thursday. This doesn't mean that you don't learn Torah every day. The mitzvah is to learn Torah every free moment. But the reading of the Torah was instituted. Now, why would it institute every day? I have to look in the commentaries. I'm sure some people talk about it. If anybody has a, a, knows a source, please share it with me. If I recall correctly, it's, number one is was being practical. People are busy. So at least once uh, in three days. That's the point. Can a person open up a Sefer Teda any day and read the Teda? The question is whether you're allowed to do that, make the brachas and so on. Most likely not. But again, that doesn't mean that we have the mitzvah of learning Teda all the time. Just not Kriya Teda. So Kriya Teda, the formal reading, is for the reason that I just explained. In last week's Pasha, we talked, about, we talked about the curses and the blessings. So the follow-up to that, what's the difference between a hidden blessing and a revealed blessing? And why would anyone want a hidden blessing if it's hidden and you can't see or appreciate it? So I want to just follow up on that since we discussed it. So the Alter Rebbe and the Kutetera, Buchu Kaisai, and the Semach Tzadik's gloss there, Ha'aga, talks about that the truth is that in the Klolis, in the Teichacha, in the negative, in the seemingly negative verses, really lies chesadim nistarim, chesadim, the chesadim nistarim, hidden chesed that's even deeper than regular chesed. And he brings actually from Moed Cotton, the Gemara Rajbi, sending Rabbi Lazar, his son, to get blessings from Bnei Marova, from the scholars in the West. And he comes back appalled because he heard from them curses until Rabbi Ishbi explains that were really blessings. So, of course, the question is, why then do they have to say it in the language of curses? So, there are many answers given that Samach Tzaddik brings there, based on Likud Tatera, because it's even greater blessings when they're couched and they're so-called cryptic, because regular chsadim are not con- are big enough containers to bring such great brachas. The only way is a language that's not seemingly positive, that allows to express things that you couldn't express in regular, the regular words. So nobody, we all look for Teva Nidava Nigla. We all want everything revealed. However, we want the deepest chsadim to be revealed. We don't want it to remain concealed. That's correct. That's where Rajbi revealed it to Rabbi Lazar. We want the best of both worlds. So the fact of the matter is that Lazar uh, Lavi, the future, when it says, Eit Hashem can after be. I will thank God, I will so gratitude, I will acknowledge God, can after be for you have afflicted me, we will then be able to see the beauty and the blessing, even in the things that seem today so negative. So that's called Ishapcha, the transformation, Ishapcha Chashech on the Eira, the darkness transformed to light, and the bitter to sweet. Since I'm doing already past let me just do one more so I get it before Shavuos, we, we get it taken care of. A few weeks ago in Pasha Emer, 
Hello, Rabbi Jacobson. Thank you for offering your anonymous question forums regarding Pasha Emer and all its attendant halachas and hash, hash kofis on Loshon Hara and Ayin Tev. So it talks there about negative, speaking negatively and having a good eye on people. Please explain why the Torah itself informs us of thoughts, speech, and actions of our forebearers that can be understood in terms of bad midas. In other words, why does the Torah tell us the negative things about people? Even behema Tameya, like Dibra Teira, Bignusha Shal Behema. The Teira doesn't even speak about negatively about an animal that's impure. It, says, it calls it an animal that's not pure. It doesn't say an animal that is, uh, that is uh, Tame. It says Eina Teira. It's not pure. It doesn't say that it is, it is uh, uh, Tame, which means impure. Not, in other words, it says it's not good, not that it says that it's bad. Clarification of this matter is essential for a Jew to deal with problems in social relations in the way that Hashem wants. May you be gesund and stark in your shlichus to bring Mashiach now. So I explained this back a few, maybe last month, that the Rebbe has a sikh on this topic, in Chelik Yud Noyach, Kutis Sichas. That when it comes to halacha, on the other hand, when you need clarity, the Torah is not going to mince words that has to tell you exactly what's right and wrong. It's going to say, this is kosher, this is not kosher. This is treif. This is Torah, this is Tomei. You have the words Tomei in the Torah. How is it consistent? Because when it's talking about the story, or it's talking about like the story by Noyach, to take the animals into the Teva, to the Ark, it's one thing. When it comes to Allah, you have to spell it out. The Torah is a, a, a book of directives. Torah Melosh Nehra. It's a guidebook. It's a blueprint. So the Torah has to tell us. And therefore will tell us very straight about a person who did something wrong. This was wrong. It's not come to talk negative about him. It's coming to teach us, to learn from that. That's the general answer. You go deeper, as the Rebbe explains on Pasha Kedach or Pasha Bolok, Pashas that are named on people that you could say, one second, why would you name a Pasha on a person who defied God, defied Moshe and so on, that there's lessons to be learned also from that person and even the element of tshuva that can be done. That there's some deeper lesson even from a person that may seem something negative. But that's already a deeper explanation. That's like similar to the clawless that you can find, even in the negative, you can find a deeper positive. But that still doesn't take away from something that the Allah has to tell us, this is right, this is wrong. Okay. There are many, many more questions, but it's, it's usually this time issue, so let me just conclude with this. Being that mountain tater is coming, I want to also say that this is 55 years this week from when the Rebbe came out with Mifzat film. It was the Shabbos, Pasha Bamidbar, Chav Dalad, Ir, two days before the Six Day War broke out. And the Rebbe spoke about Mifzat film, how it has this gula, the Gemara. The Pasuk says, Veral kal ami aret mecca. And the Gemara in Menachas talks about how the nations feared when they saw Tfilin. This, and then the Rebbe said after Shabbos this, to, 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 this, to publicize it everywhere. And in addition to everything physical that has to be done in the physical war, the spiritual war, tefillin creates an element of protection and drives fear into the enemy. So it's 55 years this year, this week, this year, Tavshim Pei Beis from Tavshim Chav Zayin. So it's worthwhile mentioning this idea. We spoke about, uh, I think, last week or two weeks ago. And it renews the point, especially when you see tragic events happening, like Yoyalei Siya, and Le Sokum Parmayim, it should never happen again, this should be the last, that we have to also understand that there is, in addition to everything physical that has to be done, there's also a spiritual element to it. In this case, it's a physical mitzvah that brings down a spiritual protection. So may Hashem protect us all. May we go into Shavuos only with good news, only brachas and good health. And may we march straight into the Gula Amitiz Vashlema where then all negative things and all tears will be wiped away from every face and only good things and only Simcha Salem Al Resham. Everyone have a Kabbalah Satera Besimcha Beprimius in the words of the Friedrich Rebbe, the Rebbe with Chazer many times. Kabbalah Satera receiving the Torah with joy and with inwardness. And this has been my life, Chassidus Applied. Special Shavuos edition. We're here every Sunday, every Sunday night, at 8 to 9 p.m. Next week we won't be here because of Shavuos. So next program will be in two weeks from now. A guten 
Shvu, a good Yomtev, and a good Tamid, and may Matan Tera and all his power continue to imbue us with, only with great blessings as we march into the ultimate Gula Mitis Rashlev, which is the, the, the by Matan Tera was the, was the Kedushin, was the, the Erison, and, by, and Nasalov will be the Nesuyan, Im Chasenose Matan Tera, the full, complete union between heaven and earth, between Hashem. God and the Jewish people and the whole world will be a world filled with divine knowledge as the waters cover the sea. Be well. This program is brought to you by My Life, Hasidus Applied. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at hasidusapplied.com slash donate.